great. Um, so you can see those things I was talking about. When uh, Kimberly Dark spoke for the students, um, the students will remember this, when she spoke at the orientation, she talked about the difference between memoir and autobiography. And their book, a memoir is like an autobiography, but it's not so dry. It has all the personal and intimate details of a person's story. And it could be you telling the story about somebody else or telling it about yourself, but it's always from personal observation. So that's an important, an important point. Um, so in this, in this session, our memoir students are uh, diving in, you know, to the pools of, of themselves. Um, memoir can come forth in, in many ways. It can come forth as a story. It can come forth as poetry, books, songs, and many other ways. Uh, tonight, you are going to hear Jimmy Baca, uh, whom Kimberly will introduce to you in a moment. And he's one of America's most talented poets, and he works with his own life material. So it's his personal. Uh, Jerry McGill also works with his own personal material. His book, Dear Marcus, explores an experience few have, and yet many have been edified by his story. And also sharing a few stories with you this evening, along with acting as MC for the rest of the event, is Kimberly Dark. She's yeah. yeah. um, been offering live storytelling performances nationally and internationally uh, for the past 20 years, so she's very experienced. And in addition to teaching uh, at, in, in the CSU, CSU San Marcos, and coordinating courses for summer arts, please welcome Kimberly Dark. Supreme Court decision that uh, legitimized more actual American families, not all, but more. I thought I would uh, start tonight with a story about my family, uh, and then I'm going to introduce you to some more exciting people. You know, my son Caleb convinced us to buy the RV. His logic was irresistible. See, he would sleep on the bed above the cab of the truck so that I wouldn't have trouble climbing up and I wouldn't fall out in case I took a sleepwalk. <laughs> he would be the one to learn to use the giant icky hose that lived in the back bumper in order to hook the RV up to the dump station. He would wear the latex gloves in the glove box when he hooked it up and turn the switch to let all the poop fall out. He would also be the one to make sure all the windows in the top hatches were closed so that nothing flew away. He would latch the cupboards and turn the lock on the refrigerator door to on so that our mustard didn't make a giant mobile kitchen mess. Really. This purchase would be 100% worry-free for me. My precious six-year-old son assured me of this. My only job, my one and only job was to buy. The RV. I mean, surely, surely I could do this one simple little thing, he said as he danced around on the sidewalk, still wearing his purple glove from the dump station lesson. <laughs> now, I gotta tell you, my girlfriend and I were already pretty certain we would buy the RV, and that's why we took him along on this second look, you know, just to make sure he was into it. I really did not ever want to touch that dump hose, so it was in my best interest to convince him that I needed convincing. <laughs> And boy, was he into it. Way into it. You know, during our first year of RV ownership, we took the quintessential American family summer vacation, the Grand Canyon, and then across the Midwest to visit my girlfriend's family. We were gone about a month, and when we returned, I spent two months waiting by the mailbox for news that my canonization had come through for the miracle of cooking everything over hot coals for an entire month. I mean, there may have been a stove in that RV, but was hot as Hades and we didn't have air conditioning. So every time we'd stop, I would sling out the charcoal, get the fire going. I had one skillet and my campfire repertoire included veggie burgers and pancakes. <laughs> over and over and over again. Okay, a few salads as well. You know, after a few months with no news of my sainthood, I decided, yeah, okay, I really do want to take another trip. During the next two years, we took a number of short trips up the California coast, one trip down to Mexico, 
Okay, we also joined a nudist camp to store the RV, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah, that's another part of the stories, really. <laughs> the three of us traveled together, and with Caleb's dad, and with our other close family friend, who is something of a fourth parent to Caleb. The RV can sleep three comfortably, four if Caleb sleeps with his dad or me, or even five with a sleeping bag in the center aisle way. You know, sometimes our family seems exceedingly normal, anachronistic really, in our desire for our son to go camping and hiking and learn to work an RV dump station, in our stalwart insistence that he learn to swim, to play a sport, to take music lessons and go roller skating. You know, he told me recently that we didn't take him to as many sporting events as many of his friends seem to have attended, but he saw a hell of a lot more dance and theater performances. <laughs> and if I did anything right, he also watched a little less TV than most as well. But then to some, because our family is broader than two parents and the genders vary, we are total freaks. I mean, because we are queer, we are, to be redundant, odd. And not only do the genders vary, so do the gender roles. One time, my son's father came over when our little boy was out in the garage doing woodworking with my girlfriend. As we looked on, he quipped, hand on hip, my God, I'm glad you're dating somebody who can teach our son to be butch. <laughs> and indeed, our son is now a competent handyman, in addition to a competent dessert maker, thanks to his cake decorator father. <laughs> you know, some people worry that a jumbled up family will be confusing to a child, damaging even. Some go so far as to say that families like mine will damage our very culture. Everything will be akimbo and moral compasses will spin wildly, leaving children crying in the streets. <laughs> But you know, that's just not how it is. I mean, I know because I have parented under these unique circumstances. And I think most families are unique somehow. It's just that some of them try to hide it. And perhaps that's more damaging to children than simply knowing what's what and who loves them and defining the terms as needed. You know, on one of those RV trips, up this way to see the monarch butterflies resting in Monterey before they flew south to Mexico. My son's father, Richard, and my girlfriend, Katie, were along on that trip with Caleb and me. Caleb was about seven years old. As Richard drove, the three of us sat at the back table, Katie reading her novel, Caleb and I having light conversation. After a thoughtful moment of silence, Caleb looked at me and said, Okay, if you're my mom, and Katie is your girlfriend, and dad's dad, and dad is your husband, then who is Katie to dad? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he wasn't distressed about it. I mean, he was just trying to get all the titles right. I was still trying to sort out the question when Katie looked up from her novel and calmly said, oh, that makes him my step spouse. <laughs> oh, said Caleb with a look of satisfaction as though that obvious detail had simply escaped him. <laughs> and then Katie went back to her book. Soon after we stopped at a gas station, because you know those RVs really drink it down. I relayed this story to Richard who chuckled and said, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> and then we had a small argument with our son about why we wouldn't buy candy at the mini mart. You know, he didn't get the M&Ms he wanted, but somehow he ended up with a lollipop. His dad is such a chump that way. We got back in the RV with me in the driver's seat, and then the three of them started a game of cards. You know, the monarch butterflies were beautiful that weekend, lining the trees and becoming a bright orange sunburst as they took flight. We attended a class and went on a hike offered by the Natural History Museum. You know, those butterfly migration patterns are amazing and complex. But somehow they figure it all out. And so do we. We figure it out like it's the most natural thing there is.
part of what memoir does, I think, it honors the complexities of human experience and the way that we make meaning of various lives. And it also reminds us, done well, it reminds us that there is actually more beauty and possibility and complexity available to humans than we normally see in the media or legitimized by government or policies. And wow, you're, you're gonna hear from um, two other folks this evening on stage here who didn't behave as they were expected to behave, and we're all the better for it. And I don't know, perhaps I'm already not what you were expecting when I first walked out here, you can decide. I mean, what a gift that is, right? When we are able to tell our vibrant stories, our difficult stories, to get some air around them and share them. And I honor all of you that are in the course this couple of weeks doing exactly that. So I'm gonna introduce you to our next reader now. Um, our students are working with both Jimmy Baca and Jerry McGill this week. And Jerry is a memoir writer from Portland, Oregon. Uh, he's from New York. He also writes for the New York Times. He's sharing a story with us this evening, just a brief one. He just flew in this afternoon. So it's nice he's on the stage tonight. He's sharing a brief story with us um, that was written for the Times. And it's about his difficulty with you know, interracial relationships after Trayvon Martin's murder. Please welcome Jerry McGill. like these even uh, before I wrote my memoir and I'm always honored this is one of my favorite things to do ever since I was a, a child I always enjoyed being in, being in front of audiences and, and just uh, addressing people and uh, one of my favorite things to do is, is writing and I'm still always impressed today that people still care about my story you know when I wrote my memoir I really thought it was this tiny little story that maybe 300 people would read and I would be satisfied with that and move on. And it became something bigger and I'm proud of that. Um, it's really something that's had a very big effect on me. I've always been touched by other people's stories and always hope that someday my story can touch someone else. So I wanna thank you all for having me here. I wanna thank Kimberly especially for taking a chance on me. She had never met me before and just heard about me so I wanna I'll let her know that I appreciate that. Um, and I'm gonna share just a, another small piece of myself. This is, as Kimberly mentioned, it's something I wrote. I've, I've written for the New York Times once and hope to do it again soon. I wrote this for their modern love section. Um, I thought it was timely, I thought it was provocative. Uh, they rejected it, but that's <laughs> quite all right with me. I'm used to rejection, I'm sure it'll happen again in there very near future, I'm cool with that. Um, this is actually my first time sharing this with anyone other than the, the modern love session of the Times. Um, it's, again, something that's very dear to me, and it's just something that was so on my mind. Uh, it was something that was really nagging at me that I just, I had to write it, and I wrote it in like 90 minutes. Uh, so here it is, it's the first time I've ever read it out loud or shared it with anyone. It's called, After Trayvon Martin, My White Girlfriend Had to Go. <laughs> Very subtle, as you can see. So, when I look back on my history of girlfriends and lovers, one thing is clear, I did not discriminate. And I'm not bragging. <laughs> Nearly all of my closest friends, male and female, have had much more experience than myself. But I have been fortunate. I have had numerous partners of a wide array of ethnicities and nationalities. Well, I did when I lived in New York and Los Angeles anyway. 
Once I moved to Oregon in my mid-twenties, well, there it was white girls all the time. <laughs> if you've ever been to Oregon, you get a good sense of why. The place is almost whiter than Montana. And I was living in a small college town to add to my monocrasticity. I remember once I did date a lovely young black woman, a grad student at the University of Oregon. But she turned out to be a heavy-duty, God-fearing Christian. And for this agnostic, scratch a little and you'll get an atheist, that wasn't going to cut it. <laughs> if you told me Beyonce was a diehard Christian, I couldn't date her. So, white chicks it was. But it's okay. Like I said, I don't discriminate. Or I didn't used to anyway. And I dated many wonderful, sensitive, proudly interesting white women. I dated writers, waitresses, dancers, bank tellers, massage therapists. I even dated a lawyer once. That's how crazy it got. <laughs> but eventually love caught up with me, and I wound up marrying a turquoise-eyed social worker and moving to Germany with her. And when that relationship ended, I returned to Oregon, and after more adventures in dating, I eventually found myself happily shacking up with a fiery redhead from South Dakota that a friend of mine set me up with. And we were great for several years. We had our fights and disagreements like any couple, but at the end of the day, we were lovers in every sense of the word. And then things changed rather suddenly. You know how you have those summer days when the sun is just blasting down on you and humidity threatens to suffocate you and then all of a sudden there comes a thick gray cloud like the sky all at once became a brillo pad and then a, a gray deluge. Well, that gray deluge for my life came in the form of the murder of Trayvon Martin, and it drenched my very soul. I had followed the case from the beginning. My girlfriend and I both did, and I was so certain the jury would bring back a guilty verdict on his murderer that I barely batted an eye during the trials. Then one night I was at my local gym working out, and I noticed all the television sets were fixed on the same CNN coverage the jury had come back with a verdict. George Zimmerman, not guilty. Really, I thought? Really? I sat there frozen with all of those, all of these active people on their treadmills and their bench presses sweating around me. I looked at them wondering how they could all just stand there when everything that could possibly go wrong had just gone wrong. I felt a rage. Tectonic plates I never knew existed within me were shifting and splitting. I wouldn't be the same after that. A jury of six women, five of them the color of my girlfriend, had decided that a black teenager's death didn't really matter so much. They had sent a message to his mother, who was the exact same hue as my mother, a rich Hershey tone, I like to call it. And this was that message. Your son and boys that look like him, they get what they got coming to them. And so I did what any self-respecting black male who felt the oppressive hand of racism squeezing his heart did. I fled. I withdrew from my girlfriend, slowly but meticulously. I chose the occasion of our lease running out to let her know that I needed time to be alone, that I wanted to work on a great American novel, and that required solitude. The fact that we lived in the whitest, most privileged section of Portland only bolstered my decision. So I rented a cheap apartment in Southern Oregon, right on the California border. And I told her I didn't know when I'd be back, but that we'd stay in touch. It was all somewhat shocking to her, but it seemed only right to me. I truly believed in my heart of hearts that there was no way I could ever truly relate to her again. People who looked like her had been holding down people who looked like me for generations. A man who looked a lot like her father had kidnapped, tortured, murdered, and raped men and women who looked a lot like my mother and father for generations. And worst of all, people who looked like her were the beneficiaries of that horror. I saw that now everywhere I looked. There's a reason why there are slums in every major city overcrowded with brown people. There's a reason why the prisons are overflowing with brown people. There's a reason why voting rights laws are being overturned in so many states. There's a reason for all of it. It suddenly all became as plain to me as the nose on my president's face. Here's the thing I need people to keep in mind. 
I don't hate white people. I can't hate white people. White people have saved my life on more occasions than I care to account. When I was a teenager, I was shot in the back and paralyzed. The doctor who successfully saw me through that, a white male. The therapist who taught me how to live again, white women. The man who was like a father to me when I had no true father and basically got me through college on a free ride, you guessed it, Whitey McWhiteville. <laughs> Some of my dearest friends are white. My favorite bosses were white. Barry Mandel is my favorite singer for Pete's sake. <laughs> oh, that's not true. He's actually, <laughs> He's actually third behind Prince and Michael Jackson. <laughs> The first woman I ever truly loved, and to whom I lost virginity, my virginity, was white. I remember my first white crush. It was Caroline Papadopoulos in the fourth grade. <laughs> my classmate pushed her to the ground during lunch, and I threatened to punch him in the face. I wanted to protect Caroline. In my stupid way, I thought that that's what love meant. You protected the one you loved. But now, post Trayvon Martin verdict, I couldn't ever imagine wanting to protect the white person again. Hell, I thought, they don't need it. It's actually us who need protecting. And oftentimes, we need protecting from them. You see it every day. Hell, you can't even read a newspaper anymore without seeing that refrain. So in Southern Oregon, I got to work on my novel, and I read a lot. I felt the enormous need to get back in touch with my so-called blackness. And so I read Baldwin, Wright, Hurston, Morrison, Haley, Hansberry, Ellison. I rewatched every Spike Lee movie, <laughs> except for school days. I can't stand school days. I tried listening to jazz, but I've never been able to get with jazz, despite being in awe of Miles Davis and Charlie Parker. I listened to Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald, Nat King Cole. God, I hope they play Nat King Cole at my funeral. I love that man. I even went back and reread Othello, my favorite Shakespeare work. And I wrote prol prolifically. I wrote three whole novels. You know what they were about? The first one was about a young black student who falls in love with a white waitress. In the end, she dies violently. <laughs> the second was about a young black waiter who falls in love with a Jewish musician. In the end, she dies violently. <laughs> the third was about a black serial killer who only kills white males. <laughs> you sense the pattern? Yeah. It doesn't take Stephen Hawking to figure it out. Hell, it doesn't even take Steven Seagal. <laughs> I was angry, and my anger was coming through in my writing. Writing was the chemotherapy that destroyed my anger cells. I remember the moment that I knew I was coming out of my anger. I was kind of like Tim Robbins' character in Shawshank Redemption, who plows through miles of excrement and emerges in a lake, his whole body cleansed by a thunderstorm. It was a moment when I wrote a screenplay. It was an interracial romantic comedy about a black Wall Street financier who falls in love with a white street performer. It had the happiest, corniest ending you could imagine. And I loved it. I'm still trying to sell it in case any of you know anybody. In there. <laughs> and so with this great awakening, I moved back to Portland. And I even reconnected with the former girlfriend. But it's not the same, and the truth is, it will never be the same, and we both know it. We don't live together, but we do spend time with one another periodically, and we enjoy each other's company thoroughly. The thing is, I came back from Southern Oregon a mere shadow of my former self. The harsh reality of ugly racism I see around me on a regular basis, and I mean every day, it haunts everything I do. But I'm not morbid. I'm not depressed. I'm just aware. I'm painfully aware that she and I live in very different worlds. And her nephew, her nephew, will never have to worry about being shot in the back by a white cop who will claim it was an accident and get off scot-free. In my mind, people who look like her will never fully grasp the bitterness and loathing that so many people like me hold inside. They can love you and you can love them, but there will always be this chasm. There's a language that me and my black friends speak that will always be in a foreign tongue and spoken in a somewhat hostile whisper. And this is maybe the worst part of racism, the thing so often left under the rug. Every harsh word, 
every wrongful imprisonment, every murder gone unpunished, unpunished, it cuts all of us. It leaves us all slowly bleeding to death on a cold pavement. Like the rapacious cancer that it is, it will chew the flesh from all of us, and eventually all that will be left is a skeleton. A skeleton with tears running down bony cheeks, wondering how we got here. Weren't we all friends once? Didn't we all love each other once? Or was it all just an illusion? I totally want you to pick up a copy of Jerry McGill's memoir, Dear Marcus, if you haven't already, right? Um, that, that memoir is called Dear Marcus, A Letter to the Man Who Shot Me. Uh, our friend Jerry, though, he writes about a number of things, as he mentioned, um, surviving drive by shooting. And that memoir is uh, a letter to the shooter he never met. So those, those are for sale in the lobby. How is that? Elegant, an elegant plug for his kind of... Okay, so I, I'm gonna share one more short piece with you uh, before I bring out Jimmy Baca. Um, if you've read Jimmy's memoir, A Place to Stand, then you know that he spent a lot of his early years uh, institutionalized in orphanage or prison. And we had this conversation last night, you know, just light dinner conversation, and um, about how, you know, the experience of confinement can uh, stay in the body for a long time after the confinement is over and pop up who knows when. We also started talking about like how problematic this is, this um, prison as business model that we have developed in the United States. And I, I started thinking after after dinner, like, wow, actually I've written about this as well, um, you know, from a very different perspective. I've never been incarcerated, but I, I went and uh, pulled up a little performance piece that I haven't actually looked at for a number of years because it seemed appropriate here. It connects me to that issue of prison for profit and. I don't know, maybe it connects you to that issue as well. So have you ever wondered, who am I? According to the catalogs and magazines sitting in my mailbox when I return home, I am a yogi who meditates wearing silky lacy sleazy underwear. <laughs> yeah, it's not the first definition of self I would normally put out in the world, I gotta tell you, but we are not who we say we are, we are what we do. And it's true, I meditate. I also have a drawer full of brassiers and colors like fierce fuchsia, fire engine, philosophical baby blue, and leaping lavender. <laughs> but what you will not find in my mailbox, despite my love of lace, is a Victoria's Secret catalog. You wanna know why, don't you? I mean, first off, those models and I are not wearing the same size these days. But more importantly still, Victoria's Secret is one of the many companies that uses cheap American prison labor. And my brassiere should not also be propping up the prison industrial complex. Thank you very much. So, you know, some of this problem is not new. Incarceration has long been more about less about public safety and service than about how we lock up our fears in places other than our own hearts. How we make others the receptacles of our collective evils, the darker the better. But let's think this through. The United States currently imprisons more than two million of its citizens, a number more than double 20 years ago, and the majority are nonviolent offenders. And what a workforce. You don't have to pay minimum wage or shipping from third world nations. They can't unionize, and most felons will never vote again. Reduction of crime? Rehabilitation? Why would we want those? We, the prison guards union, the surveillance sellers, the construction companies, and all of those folks 
who sell a captive audience goods and services they can't decide not to consume. Can we decide not to consume? Or are we too locked into the lifestyle that ping pong panty might provide, never pausing to ask if the prison population must grow for profit? When will they come for you? For you? For your children? Now, I don't know everything, but I try to think before I consume because you know I want nothing but joy in this decaf. <laughs> and we are not who we say we are. We are what we do. Folks, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Jimmy Santiago Baca. He is American Book Award winner in poetry, International Hispanic Heritage Award winner, Pushkar Prize recipient, author of dozens of books that have been translated into more than 30 languages. He gives poetry and language not only to us here at programs like this, but also to folks um, on farms and in prisons and on reservations, children and adults. Please join me in welcoming Jimmy Baca. place to stand about what happened to this guy in prison. And a lot of people were asking me to write something about what happens after prison. So I decided to write something about what happens after prison. And it's called, um, uh, just for all you novices, it's called American Orphan. But for the novices that are going to embark on writing a memoir, this is going to be the second one in the, in the trilogy. Um, it started out on the, you gotta write through the story. So when I wrote through the story, it was 1,400 pages. Wow. Yeah, and now it's 450. And I'll tell you what, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great life to be a writer and a poet, but basically what it is, is you, uh, you're at the, you, it's a life where you throw the best of your stuff away because it just doesn't fit. And how many times have all of you been in a situation where, oh God, that is so beautiful, and you've got to let it go. That's called crap. It starts page number one. I prefaced every chapter with a little couplet or something. Uh, American Orphan, chapter one. And the couplets are from letters that he wrote in prison. Wishing to the fairy godmother and hurling your baby tooth to the moon. What an amazing theory to rehabilitate the criminal element. Chapter one. I know this tale of penance and redemption is steeped in the romantic road marks of a modern day Siddhartha. Setting out on the hero's journey and it may seem that way on the surface. Five-year-old brother and I plucked from bed at grandma's and driven through canyons to arrive at an orphanage and delivered the three figures in dark robes on a rain-swept night who escort us inside the three-story red brick building upstairs to the third floor and into a creaking dorm and appoint us a cot and depart. In a way, yes, so begins this modest tale of mine as an American orphan. In a fashion Twain, Dickens, or Dostoevsky would cherish in a decaying dormitory with dozens of kids in bunks, separated by hanging sheets soaked wet from rain coming in through ceiling cracks, I wept on my bunk. I want mama, 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 mama. I want mama and Camilo. 
Appearing before me in a flash of lightning struck me across the page, warning Orlando, no llores, cabrón, don't you cry, they'll beat you up, don't cry. Ah, well, 30 years later, having finished my prison term, I think, hey, dear brother, I don't cry anymore. Despite my unwillingness to get along with the administration and doing day for day, at 29, August of 78, I was finally released from Youngsville Prison in Colorado, completing six years for selling heroin. On the way out, my spirit lofted in awe of the night morning. I dropped off my box of notebooks and letters to go to my sisters and picked up my airline ticket to New Mexico in a hundred bucks. As much as I would like to imbue my imprisonment with a cavalier claim that it was filled with adventure, it was anything but. Unlike the fools in those fucking prison movies who glamorize it. Truth was, I was a stupid 22-year-old when I got busted. Eight cents in my pocket and a court-appointed lawyer. Fuck the adventure. For years, I glimpsed a bit of the morning moon between the guard towers and used my imagination to write poems about a moon without razor wire cutting across its surface. And for years I peered at the sunrise through a scratch in the painted window. And for almost a decade, while my mind roamed outside the walls, my body faced the nine by 12 road. I didn't know what to expect passing through the big gates and through the dark heart of freedom, but the moment that my foot fell on freedom ground, I had trouble walking. My legs got shaky and my gut nervous. Freedom was large, Lord large, and standing outside, the moon dwarfed me to a speck and took my breath away. I couldn't believe it. Presented with a view of the world without bars, walls, and razor wire, the state unclenched its chokehold and I inhaled the clean morning air. I was weightless, and I ceased to exist, an insignificant soul in so much space. I found myself drifting in so much free will it scared the hell out of me. I had the sensation that I was falling and felt like I had just landed on a new planet with no gravity. In prison, I knew who I was, but out here, I was no one. A stranger in the dawn staring at the stars. One small step for criminal kind. One giant step for Orlando Lucero. Ambling as awkward as an astronaut in space, the immensity of the sky and earth made it almost impossible to get my bearing and forced me to stop and get my balance. So much space. I felt myself floating in an aimless pause, as if my life had seized and abandoned me in a stillness between the end of a prison sentence and the beginning of freedom. And I didn't have the words to name this independence. I knew if I couldn't find them to express myself in this new context and engage it, I'd be lost as a wandering soul in Dante's wasteland a grim smoke trail, willowing off the felon's flesh and bone heap, dissipating into nothing but the tortured moans for our return to prison. No rash decisions or thought. Definitely no more dealing. I was a different man, moving lightly, looking at life from a whole different perspective. I smiled at the dirt, the weeds, and the stones as if they shared my pride of joy. It could have been the golden sunrise or maybe the silence over the high prairie desert, but I was feeling nostalgic and philosophical and for a moment I wondered about my past, present, future, the dozens of love letters I'd written over the last year to Lila, vowing my eternal love. I finished my time, yet the sadness of leaving so many friends behind clothed my skin like a fever. But between the gate and the van, my life was uprooted from the granite ruins and the criminal paperwork that condemned me scattered across the warden's lawn and a new narrative of life began. I mentally noted a goodbye prayer for those left behind and I helped me Lord prayer as I stepped toward the white van idling in the employee parking lot and we drove away. With a certain reluctance, I glanced at the prison that seemed to have a strange force drawing me back, but I was determined. I wasn't coming back. As the guard locked the van doors and shifted into gear, and we turned down a road, my skin seemed to fit better. That massive spaceship of iron and concrete, that hulking empire of the doomed, 
sailed away into the dark horizon without me this time. Collecting debris of more broken lives, and I'll tell myself, I tell myself loud and louder. And I say it loud that the morning moon shone on me and murmured her affirmation, whispering, You, O oh soul shifter, have endured the dreamer's ritual and become a spirit. Chapter 2. The poetry here. Still awake in the morning after we had talked all night through the bars, we saw the cell block fluorescent lights go on and laughed as sparrows nesting in the rafters started chirping at the false dawn. Chapter 2. Moments like this cry out for an epiphany, a climax. Like in those Ben Hur and Moses movies I watched as a child. Mountains, split chariots, splinter prophets wheel the staff to command legions of angels swooping down on the desert heaven. But no, in a time of epidemic mediocrity, pervasive corruption, and endless wars, that the cello player were to appear and strum the sweetest dirge to commemorate this memorable crossroads in my life, he'd be arrested for trespassing and playing without a permit. Nothing but the exhaust pipe sputtering and wailing Jennings on the radio, a dumbass guard smoking discount res cigarettes, and three other convicts threatening to kill each other. One black, one white, one Chicano. Outlaws in the B-roll spaghetti western, the four gutter grunges. <laughs> and I smiled with irony at my reflection in the window. No medieval night were we on a romantic quest. We were criminalized killers. Thieves, drug addicts, seething to avenge our main heart on any motherfucker unlucky enough to be present when we blew. And it was just business as usual. Happening a thousand times over America, every single morning with men like us who'd been broken and a resentful brute, who'd waited a long time for the hour to fall to purge our rage on society for the unjust torture inflicted on us. And these three, Having lived in cells next to each other for decades with nothing to do, fantasize extreme ways to kill each other. Ah, well, sometimes that nasty joker in the deck shows up when one is holding the best of hands, creating this laughable situation, possessing them with chilling images of how they dismember the other two once we arrived at the terminal. It could have been maybe 30 minutes or three minutes, I don't know, I was mesmerized by the reflection of my face that I hadn't seen in so long, now on the glass skimming over flat roof shacks and scrub brush and sage, until we finally glided under the corrugated airport terminal. All right, here's where daddy leaves his bitches. The guard growled and swung to the curb and pulled at us quickly, leaving us stranded like four ducks on a busy intersection. We stood saying nothing in the habit of being told what to do, where to walk, just standing there until the Chicana said, I need a drink while I kill you fuck faces. And the skinhead followed in the black behind him, and I took up the rear thinking, shit, man, when water rises to the chin, find a straw. And that straw was an end stool at the bar where I sat in case some crazy shit broke out. I ordered water. Skinhead snarled, motherfucker and ordered Jack and Coke, the Chicano tequila, and the black vodka. They stared in the mirror, and the Chicano said, we next to each other 20 years in that dungeon, and then we're released at the same time? Motherfucker. <laughs> he downed his drink and shot two fingers at the bartender double. Cruel and unusual punishment, skinhead licked his lips. Here, here. To the one who filed the class action suit, he drained his glass and slid it toward the bartender, do it. It be how he did. The black brother gazed in the mirror. It be how he did. Please, with the vodka. He raised his glass. I'll take it how they give it in seconds, minutes, hours, days, or years. I don't give a shit. All the freedom they want to give, it be how they did. Why'd you want to kill each other? That, the gang thing, I asked. It was always a gang thing. You posing up as a fucking counselor now, the brother stated. 
I asked only because we ain't inside anymore. I said, and after another an uncomfortable silence set in, I added, and if I was your concert, God knows you all need one. I'll be making mad money with you crazy motherfuckers. <laughs> I had a million reasons to gush these, and out here I can't scare up nary one that skinhead offered. Toast, I raised my glass of water to a killing of burger. Wouldn't speak so soon, asshole, she kind of grinned. <laughs> hey, hey, the other two chimed in. They ordered more drinks and stared at the mirror, wondering, measuring the uncalculable damage years in prison had inflicted on them. Not wanting to notice what could have been and never was, they ordered more drinks. They were buzzed and I said goodbye and they wrote their address on napkins, a pool hall, a bar, and a laundromat in Portland. The temperature on my skin went up again. I'd miss them. Feeling bad for us, I went up the escalator and headed for my gate. I was in the same sorry condition, no home or address, but I was heading to New Mexico to jumpstart my life. Chapter three, poem. This love we have, your letters, they are the very life source of my living these days in prison. With our letters, they can put all the spotlights they want and will never find me the way I am in your letters. Chapter three. When I arrived in Albuquerque International Airport, I caught the bus and headed for my brothers. I planned on staying with them until I could get a job and settle in. I got off on Isleta and memories flooded me. Drugs, brawls, running from cops, chasing enemies over fences and back there. I draw a curtain over those days it's a new day, a new me. I followed the driveway alongside the main house and crossed the dirt road to the small cinder block rental in the back. I wonder how to greet you, Camino. Shall I meet you with a false smile that our lives are good or a grim acceptance that our lives are shambled wrecks? We've changed, a lot of things have, except I still feel responsible for you, brother. I feel the need to protect you. I feel guilty that I've done a poor job of it. The more you sink into despair, the deeper you descend into drugs and booze, and you cease to struggle to free yourself from the quicksand of addiction and that carries you in its jaws, and your will for life is just gone. And after repeated raps, you don't answer. I know you're ashamed. I keep knocking, going around the apartment, Camilo, Camilo, from front window to back door to bathroom window till the front door creaks open and he appears unkempt, gray as ashes. Cheeks gone, teeth yellow, and after a meal, litter of bones. Hey, hey, I smile. What's up? I'm out, man. I'm free, brother. Free. I spread my arms for a hug, but Camilo turns. Hey, uh, come on in. Good. Distant. Emotionally unattached. I'm conflicted, not knowing what to do or how to help. I don't know how to grab this moment and make it ours. I don't know how to rewind this moment back to a no-worry time. Playing in grandma's yard, we trap a horny toad in the weed. The afternoon fragrant with prairie grass, the breeze burning for pinto beans, boiling in a pressure cooker and red chilies simmering in skills. Take it back, but I don't know how. Back then, we were as innocent and lovely as two buttered tortillas warmed on the wood stove. But that time's gone, and the day is what it is. A page ripped from the book of dreams and crumpled in the wastebasket of nightmares. You smoke meth in the bathroom thinking, I don't know. I've seen the way addicts tweak on it. Bad shit. They exhibit scratchy, twitchy behavior, like looking under a bed a hundred times, screaming for hours, saying the devil's on the wall. Camino hollers behind the bathroom door, getting ready. Okay, I'm annoyed. I play along knowing he doesn't realize how many times he's repeated himself. I sit on the couch and imagine every hit on the pipe Camille's brain is like a track. Bells ring and warning at the cross and danger that a train is near, but it never arrives. The bells just keep ringing. I lead through stacks of old magazines I flip the lamp on, but it doesn't work. They don't have any light bulbs. And I know Camille's used them to smoke meth. I pull the blinds to let light in. I sit back and I run this through old news weeks. And the news is unbelievable. It's as if I'm waking from a decade-long coma. Nixon resigned. 
Vietnam War ended. What the fuck was Vietnam? Jimmy Carter, who was he? Flip Warren. Who was Roe versus Wade? Jim Jones and 900 people in Rwanda died in a mass suicide? Iranian militant students seized the U.S. Embassy in Tehran? Who the fuck was Cesar Chavez? <laughs> a billionaire white chick named Patty Hearst was hooked up with his black brothers and George Wallace got shot. You fucking kidding me? Elvis died? Fuck you! <laughs> Each bit of news gives my heart a paper cut. I yell, let's go, man, I'm hungry. Camila goes back, I'm getting ready. Khan say prison is the real life. That hit in the streets is like spring break with an edge. You get fucked up, you party, you do all kinds of insane shit. You commit crimes, you take drugs. And any amount chasing the moment's pleasure at any cost, fuck till your dick can't get hard anymore. And then back to your real world and real life inside the walls. Prisons are just scary, man. Lots of kids dream of going in because it carries this heroic romance for low esteem teens. It's all part of la vida loca. What used to be a deterrence becomes something to look forward to. And for me, there's so much time to pass now framed in a way I could understand and measure by events and people made me fucking feel stupid. It was a little late to throw hip huggers on in quads and head to San Francisco with flowers in my hair. I couldn't dash out and catch the 70s. What I missed, I missed. God is such an eerie little fuck machine. An ice cream truck that arrives unannounced ringing his little fucking bell. Sometimes if you're lucky, you can catch him. But once the trucks turn that corner, there's no calling it back. And all I can do is watch others lift their chocolate bombers and sugar push-ups and pretend I don't care, but I do. <laughs> Reading about the 70s made prison a tomb. I rose from unreleased to rowing with the living. So easy to mess up and go back. If you suddenly find yourself bellying in the shadows with no connection, discarded in a strange land and you don't recognize anything except your own suspicious status. But despite my self-doubt, I vowed, I was gonna creep forward and deal with this shit and make it. I was determined not to catch up to time prison rates. Shooting heroin, snorting coke, smoking meth or crack, hurling myself to the limit of indulgence wanting to get my brain splattered by some wheel in the club. Poetic pot that I am, I was gonna catch up. If I was gonna catch up, it would be death by fucking my brains out and hopefully forget the years in the devil's daycare. Chapter four. <laughs> Here's the poem. My love grows in ferocious growls for you. I fend for no one but a wound in me. A wound so great it's taken on being a being of itself. Breathing and speaking in my blood. My hands clench your hair, my fangs of my fingers, the fangs of my fingers want to tear you apart. I have so much hunger for you, woman. Chapter four. After your wired hop, we drive to the foothills east of Albuquerque to a steakhouse to celebrate a reunion and we call the good times. You remember, you remember those crazy parties, Camilo and those mountains with the cater and all those crazy chicks, man? Or at junior high, you on the court and me cheering, go Camilo, go, you were so good, dude. And after the football games and the cheerleader on the ditch bank and the trees making out, dude, I used to be so envious of you, man. You remember working at the motel, assistant manager on Santa, and you saved enough money to buy that crazy ass Carmagia, and we went cruising at Lionel's Burger. You remember that? And sitting across from Camilo, I noticed his complexion flush. His eyes glass over, and as we toast the good times in our third shot of tequila, he threatens to kick my ass. It comes out a wrecking ball on me. In the past, I let Camilo beat on me in time he wanted because I loved him. He terrorized me and I loved him. But I want to warn him I'm a different man. He can't threaten me, but he doesn't know that. And I also know that if he touches me, the monster in me will flare its claws and lunge. It's a monster part of me created in prison and made me a man who would allow, not allow transgressions. I wanted to say we change. Be careful where you tread, dear Camilo. But I didn't, hoping his intimidation would pass. In the black guy, he's not the brother smiling. 
I encourage this strange man to have fun. Come on, celebrate with me. But he's our dad. God damn it. That's for the fun. <laughs> yeah, when you get all the notice in the fucking world, you gotta turn the shit off. Anyway, but he's our dad who broke Camilo's leg and beat him frequently, but I'm not having any of it. We're supposed to be brothers. I tell Camilo, enough threats, somebody quit pushing me, quit insulting me. No more carnal, por favor, ya se acabó ese pedo, hombre. We're done with this, hombre, please. And I want to keep, I want to, I want to leap, and I want to mow through him with razor blade wings screaming, enough fucking self-pity. I mean, no one's there reaching out a Samaritan hand. We got to do it ourselves, caring for each other, being together is the best way to do that. And then he goes to slap me. And I grab his hand midair and stare down into his alien eyes and I warn him, please, Camilo, something happened to me. A monster paces in my heart, don't enrage it. And my sense of balance swirls in a buzzing motion and I'm blinded momentarily. Things go dark and I swallow the darkness and it rushes with such force from my heart into my veins it makes my hands shake and my face tremor and I feel like darkness is gonna explode from my eyes and ears and mouth. And Camilo swings and hits me with his other hand. And I can't move. And sorrow's black limbs wrap me in a violent embrace. Feet to my knee, to my chest, and hurls me out of my chair and I grab Camilo and I shove him outside. Quit fucking hitting me! I groan. Something happened to me, motherfucker! And the whole world beyond the bar and the parking lot and the canyon seemed an extension of Camilo. And it seemed that everything beyond the physical boundaries of my body had been beaten on me since I was born. The boogeyman was alive and well in me having no family, no parents, no home, no food, no clothes, no education. Beaten on me, the boy roaming streets at night, shrouded, and I was scared. I was scared of women, I was scared of men. I was scared of boys who bullied me, and all of these assaults rolled up into the fact that I was unprotected, exposed and at the mercy of rapists and murderers and brutal police and drug dealers and gangbangers, alone and hated by society, the stainless steel stake of dread hammered into the marrow of my bones and etched its cruel condemnation on my heart. And when I swung at Camilo and knocked him down on the asphalt, I was swinging at the malicious violations against me, the slaps and the bruises on my boyhood body, my teenage teeth knocked out, my man jaw broken. I was the brick wall of kid who can't express himself punches and frustration. The kitchen table shattered to smithereens by a man finding his wife left him. The vein the heroin needle pierces when a kid finds out his mother doesn't want him. The gutter a father snores in, dreaming of the son he doesn't want. And I raged at the perpetrators who flashed at me from Camilo's grin, crushing my spirit with its appeal. Beat me, little brother. Break me into pieces that can never be put back together. And the pendulum blade of bigots and racists sliced the moment in two, and from the wound projected Camilo's sneer, and I wanted to wipe it off his face. His eyes scoffed. You're doing right, little brother. We came into this world through a drug addict's vagina, scudding like fucking rats in the trash. Hit me, brother, hit me. And every drop of blood on his lips and chin and cheeks affirmed my worthlessness. The pavement shimmered red with news that I'm unwanted. Do not belong except on the ground with the world kicking me and beating me, with me leering my give a fuck grin. Beat me, world, until I'm gone, world, until I return to the nothingness from where I came. And Camilo didn't fight back. His surrender gave him consolation he felt comfortable in, allowed him to be his victim, his love, and allowed him his love for me, feeling alive in his helplessness. Camilo said without words, Yay, little brother, beat me until I can sigh finally with relief that I am no more, that this world can no longer hurt me. I crawled into this life owned by others to fuck and beat and starve, not allowed to speak nor describe my feelings to others because I had no right to this face or these hands or this feet or my sleep or my dreams. I was a mistake, 
to erase from the page of the living. And his eyes glisten. Make my blood wash over me, brother. Make me forget me. Force me to fade, to drift into the unknown where men like me, unknown men, who arrived unknown and lived unknown and were removed as if they never existed. Remove me, little brother, remove me. And with every numb strike of my fist, I tried to wipe away the look in his eyes that kept repeating in the unspoken language of the oppressed, get me, make me vanish. And I all remember as I remember yelling, defend yourself, man, hit me back, and we love to hit me. And the chill of the dust and the stillness of the sky left me disoriented, displaced in a distant and menacing place where I couldn't recognize anything. This region of hell was unnameable. And then I stopped and backed away. I walked, but was uh, not aware that I walked. I moved, but was immobile. I was panting hard, but not present. I was scared, but fearless. I was in this world, but outside of it. And I walked back to town. A sad moment, fucked up seeing me walking down that mountain road embracing myself with my arms and my head down. Wanting to cry, but not. Torso leaning forward in my heart burning horizon, the horizon with more sorrow for hitting my brother. And all that black smoke rising in my eyes making me hold my tears back. But halfway to town, I'm worried. And I return to the restaurant and find my brother's left. I turn and walk down the canyon even though my whole life was a crime scene. And I was a crime. It corrupted everything I touched. down to the two aisles here. So if you have a, a question, yeah, yeah lies. <laughs> you have a question for anybody on the stage, then step on down to one of these two microphones, please. Oh, I see somebody coming forward. Hello, testing, testing. Question and comment for Jerry. I read your book. Um, Shawshank Redemption is one of my favorite movies. So uh, when you put the part in there about um, the older man, you know, doing the whole, he decided he, he couldn't make it because he had become institutionalized. And one of the the best quotes in that movie was in uh, Morgan Freeman's character it says, you know, you can get busy living or get busy dying. And Oh, okay, okay, yes, okay. Yes, yes. Well, and I, I applaud that for you, but I wanna know, I, I know we talked in class about the moment of consciousness today. So what was your moment of consciousness when you made the decision to get busy living and not let what happened to you consume you? I'm sorry, what was your name? Oh, I'm sorry, Tina. 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 Pleasure to meet you, Tina. 
Um, yo, know, I get asked that question a lot, Tina. Like, you know, when was the moment when you realized that you weren't gonna be angry anymore? Or you weren't gonna be uh, pissed off about what happened to you? Um, and the reality is, I can't really pinpoint a moment when I said, "Hey, you know, it's like it's beautiful in that movie." I don't know if you remember that scene, but I love that scene so much too because there's a beautiful visual image when Tim Robbins and Morgan Freeman are first talking. They're talking in the shade. Mm -hmm. And there's like this little slice, and the sun is over here, mm -hmm. and they're talking in the shade. And when Tim Robbins says that line, he walks over into the sunlight, mm -hmm. and I think it's a wonderful visual moment. Uh, I can't recall a time when I left the shade and walked into the sunlight. What I can tell you, though, is that I was so fortunate to be surrounded by wonderful people while I was in the hospital that I almost feel like I never, I never really lived in this dark time um, because I was so surrounded by love, I was so surrounded by positivity, that I remember there were little tiny brief moments of depression. Um, and also, I can tell you, in all honesty, I've always had kind of a sunny disposition, even as a, as a child, um, that never really went away even after my shooting. So I can, I can tell you there was never one moment or one thing I can pin down and say, okay, this was a time when I said I'm not gonna be angry. I was never really angry. I was bummed from time to time, mm -hmm. but for the most part, I always realized, but, and it, this came from the people around me in the hospital who loved me, I always realized that I was gonna have a future and that I was gonna do well if I stayed down a positive path and I didn't let darkness overcome me. So that's, that's, my, that's my answer, I'm sticking to it. Good enough, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tina. Questions. There's another microphone on this side if you're coming down. It's a question for both of you, and uh, both of you are wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, both of you have had some very interesting challenges in your lives to deal with. How is, if it has, how is humor, and I thought of this because Jerry, your piece was, and Jimmy too, but Jerry, Jerry your piece, you used humor in a very strong way. How does humor help you deal with your own trials and tribulations? And you're right. <laughs> um, uh, humor has meant the world to me, as uh, you can imagine. Um, uh, I really believe, like many, any almost any comedian will tell you, um, that humor comes from a very dark place. But I always, you know, I was always a class clown as a kid as well. I was that kid who teachers hated. Uh, because I couldn't stop cracking jokes while the teacher was talking. And it's funny because a year later I would be a teacher and I would have all those students in my class as well. <laughs> I'd have to deal with them. Uh, but I, I gotta tell you, humor has always been something I fall back on. It comes out of me even times when I don't know it. Um, and it's just, it's meant the world to me. It, it, it's, it's a reminder. Um, and it's also a, a kind of a defense mechanism. But it's a reminder that almost any subject, you can find some tiny ray of something in it. Um, it's, it's always meant the world to me. It's always something I, I, I hope I never lose, and when I lose it, I don't think I'll want to be around anymore. So, I, I won't lose it. <laughs> but yes, it's very important. Well, no, I feel the same way. No, no, no. Everything he said, I agree with. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I like I, everything he said, when I, you know. It's just, it's just another way of, of, of disarming uh, the world's hardships, you know? I totally agree, humor is it. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, it's a different aspect when you use humor in fiction and when you use humor in life. It's two different things. So one is literary and the other one's life force. And one's manipulated and the other one's not. You know? So there's different types of shades of, of humor as opposed to shades of gray. <laughs> and I've never read the book and never intend to read it. Unless I run out of, room, unless I run out of toilet paper in the outhouse one day, I might. <laughs>
So what's the messengers? What are they doing? They're pumping billions and trillions into taking our kids to prison now. Boy, are they nefarious. More kids are going to prison a day in this country than has ever even been dreamed of. Dreamed of. More young black youth in Milwaukee alone, the city of Milwaukee, more black youth are being put in prison every day there than anywhere in the world. The world. In Milwaukee. The world. And you can just go on and on and on. We're getting hit, but we have really, really defiled the trust that the children gave us by not stepping up. Because we're worried about our mortgage, we're worried about our health, we're worried about the bills, we're worried, we're worried, we're worried, we're worried. What? The worry. You know, they set us up so we can't do anything now. Unless we abandon everything. And that's what art does. His writing, my work, your movies work, Lydia's work. What we've decided to do at some point in our life is abandon ourselves to it. And the musicians here and the, and the people who dance and all that, it's just a, it's a reckoning. At what point in the crossroads do you decide to abandon it? Abandon the so-called house with a white picket fence. Abandon the not looking at the homeless on the streets. Abandon all of these crude habits that have inured us to our own miserable existence. When will we just stop and say, I'm going to abandon that? and start to live today. Like he said, in the Shawshank Redemption, when are you going to start living? And that question applies to anybody in this room. And thank God I decided I'd start when I was loving the stories at nine. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Just, I'd like to ask you for one more round of applause for Jane McGill and Jane McGill. Thank you so much for coming to us.